Hello everyone and thank you for joining our broadcast from Car Baptist Church again this morning. We trust that as we meet each of us will feel a sense of God's presence and instruction in each of our hearts. The psalmist David writes, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can measure. It's so important to take time outs in our week, uh, to focus on our creator and forget a little bit about the created. I'm sure many of us are looking forward to enjoy some form of fellowship again in our church buildings. Well, some good news uh, that God willing, we are making preparations to return on the last two Wednesday evenings in July for prayer. And then meeting on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays from Sunday the 2nd of August. So please pray for these preparations as they're put in place that we can meet safely again and worship side by side. More details will follow in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, we want to pass on our thanks to all who have helped and serve God by putting together the online ministries. And I mean those behind the camera as much as those in front of the camera. Thank you, may God bless you and bless the efforts in his name. In just a few moments, Keith Lindsay is going to bring a message to the children. Thank you, Keith. And immediately after that, Hannah Cordner will read from God's word, reading from Judges chapter 16 today. And then Pastor Andrew will share a message from God's word. So we pray God's blessing upon each of you and thank you again for all your efforts. Let us just take a moment and, and commit this morning's uh, meeting together in prayer before the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to meet in this way. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace and loving kindness in each of our lives since we last met in this way. Father, we thank you for all that we have, all that you have given us, your leading and direction in each of our lives. You have taken care of us and, pre and preserved us from situations that we didn't even fully appreciate. Father, we call upon you this morning because you alone are worthy. You are the one who is great and most worthy of praise. We thank you for giving us Jesus. We thank you, Father, that even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you because of that this morning we call you Father. And Father, as we meet this morning, may you be the very centre of our thoughts and our worship and our praise. Thank you for all who will take part this morning, Father. We pray your blessing upon them. May their ministries uh, resonate into our hearts and may we go away from this uh, broadcast being fulfilled. Father, we just remember those who have had a difficult week. We remember them again and bring them before you. Father, we'd love to see them relieved from their suffering or from their loneliness. And Father, you know their situation. We ask that you would draw close, that your presence would be near to them. And Father, they would be conscious that the people of Car are praying for them again today. Father, we just thank you for the blessing of the week that has passed through the ministry. We thank you for Pastor Andrew's ongoing uh, messages. We thank you for the report from Baptist Missions from Mervyn Scott. We thank you for the children's ministries on Friday night. And Father, may all these efforts be blessed by you. Father, we think of the homes that this, these messages go into. And Father, you know that there is a word in season for each one of us. And we just pray as people consider what is said, they will think about eternal matters and uh, consider uh, Jesus while he may be found. Father, we just pray your blessing upon this time just now. And as we go forward this morning, may we all sense your presence with us, praying for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi boys and girls, good to be with you. And I brought my little friend with me today. Maybe some of you have met him before. His name is Red. 
and he wanted to come to see all the boys and girls today with me. Now, I don't know whether in lockdown that you've been baking or not. Maybe you've been helping the grown-ups at home making buns and maybe making cakes and enjoying eating them. I know lots of boys and girls have been doing that. Well, my wee friend Red, he loves to bake as well. And so one day he wanted to help his mum in the kitchen because one of the favourite things that he loved to make is cherry cake. And so he got out the ingredients to help his mum and he got out the baking bowl, he got out the spatula to help make the mixture, he got out the flour, he got out the eggs, he got out the scales to make the measure, the, the mixture in and they put it all together in the baking bowl. But there was one thing of course that was very important that had to go in to the cake mixture and that was cherries. Red loves cherries. Red sticky cherries. And well, he helped his mum put them in. He put one into the mixture and then he got the fork and he put one into his mouth. And then he put another one into the mixture and another one into his mouth. And his mum said, Red, don't eat all the cherries because if you eat them all, they're going to be none for the cake. And so they got the cherries and they put them into the mixture and he mixed it round and round and round and round and round till he was nearly dizzy. And then they got out the baking tin and they put it into the baking tin and then they put it into the oven for the cook. Now, Red helped his mum do up the dishes and then he went into the room to play his PlayStation because they were having visitors that night and, well, he knew that he would get some cherry cake in the evening time when the visitors would come and he could not wait, yummy yummy, for that. So he was playing his PlayStation, yow, 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 having a race on it and then his mum came in and she said, Red, I have to just go across the road to the shop. I want you to stay here, don't answer the door, don't answer the telephone. And I want you to be a good boy. Don't touch anything. And don't touch the cherry cake. I've just taken it out of the oven and it's sitting on the cooling rack. Please don't touch it. And of course, he said that he would be a good boy. His mum went out. She closed the door. He heard her walking down the path. And then whenever he was sitting playing with the PlayStation, suddenly into the room. Oh. He could smell the cherry cake. And he thought, if only I just have a little look at it. So when he went into the kitchen, and there sitting on the workbench on the cooling rack was the cherry cake. Oh, if only he could have a piece of it, but he wasn't allowed to touch it. And then he thought, my mum isn't a very good baker sometimes. And sometimes the cherries always go to the bottom of the cake. So he turned the cake over very carefully on the baking tray. And there, sure enough, were lots of cherries all dotted around the bottom of the cake. And he thought, if only I could have one. And so he got in the fork out of the drawer and he stuck the fork in and there he pulled out a cherry. Oh, oh and he had the cherry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he put another fork in again and then another cherry. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he had another one. And sure enough, in again and... He had another, oh, he realised, look at the big hole in the bottom of the cherry cake. Oh, mum's going to go mad, what's she going to say? And so he brushed away the crumbs, he turned the cherry cake back over and it looked absolutely perfect. And off he went, back into the room, playing with the PlayStation and mum came in. Red, were you a good boy whenever I was away? What do you think he said? Do you think he said no? Of course not. Yes, mummy, of course I was a good boy. You know, you didn't touch anything. No, I never touched anything. Well, that night the visitors came. They had their tea. After tea, they brought out the cherry cake. And Red said, excuse me, but I'm too full. Can I go now? And he left. His mum couldn't understand. That night he went to bed. He lay down in bed. Oh, but he couldn't sleep. He tried to count sheep. One, two, three. Oh, but he couldn't sleep. And his mum came up the stairs and into the room and she said to him, Red, you're not sleeping, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong, mum. She sat down in the bed. She said to him, Red, tell me this. Did you see anyone touch the cherry cake? Because today, whenever I cut the cherry cake when our visitors were here, she said there was a big hole in the bottom of it. Oh! <gasps> and he thought, oh dear. I know, mum. He said, the cat, the cat did that. She looked at him and she said, Red, 
That's the very first cat that I've ever known to use a fork. Red was caught, wasn't he? You know, sometimes we do things that are wrong. And sometimes we think that no one can see. Maybe the grown-ups can't see. Maybe our brothers and sisters can't see. But there's someone who sees everything that we do. And who is that? It's God. And the Lord Jesus can see everything that we do. The Bible in Numbers 32 verse 23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. And so we need to be careful, don't we? Because maybe the grown-ups at home can't see the wrong things that we do or the pastor can't see the wrong things that we do. But God can see everything. We need to come to him and say sorry for all the wrong things that we have done. We need most importantly to ask the Lord Jesus into our hearts to be our saviour. And then we need to ask him day by day to ask us to forgive us for the wrong things we have done that day. And he promises that he will forgive us that he will cleanse us from all the wrong things that we do. Remember our verse today, Numbers 32, verse 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Thanks for listening, and maybe you'll meet Red again very, very soon. Okay, bye. Hi guys, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. I'm really looking forward to seeing you all again very soon. Today's reading is taken from Judges chapter 16, verses 4 to 22. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies, and how you might be bound, that one could subdue you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom and the web. And she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him. His soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. We know the Lord will bless the public reading of his word. Good morning and thank you to Johnny for leading us this morning. Well, the big day has almost arrived. The day thousands of people have been longing for since lockdown back in March. The day that will come as a huge relief to so many people when the hairdressers will open again for business. And countless numbers of women and men have their appointment already made in order that they can talk about the holiday they didn't have 
and in order that the hairdressers and barbers can fix the car crash DIY haircuts some of which seem to have been carried out by Bartimaeus before he met Jesus. Today we're studying the man with the most infamous hairdressing episode in the Bible. In fact, the man with the most expensive haircut in history. And we can make it fun and have a laugh about our long-awaited visit to the hairdressers. But there's nothing comical about this hairdressing incident because it tells of the tragic, catastrophic, humiliating demise of the strongest man who ever lived, Samson. And as we take a brief overview of his life, we see three things in his story. First of all, we see his promising start. Undoubtedly, the book of Judges makes for very grim reading. Someone has said Judges can be described as despicable people doing deplorable things. And that's true. However, the book reminds us that God of God's inexhaustible mercy and grace and patience with his people. A God who works through his people despite their sinfulness and stubbornness and foolishness. We see that God's grace triumphs over all our sin. After the death of Joshua, there was widespread declension and unfaithfulness in the land of Israel. The people refused to drive out the heathen inhabitants of the land. Rather, they embraced their paganism, their idolatry, and consequently God repeatedly handed God to his people over to their Gentile enemies. So for years, there was a cycle of rebellion followed by remorse and repentance as the people under the curse from their oppressors cried out to God for help and he raised up judges. And it's from these leaders that this particular book we're starting today gets its name. This book was is dated between the years 1000 and 1050 BC and the book ends in a very sour note. We're told in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The days are dark, the people are inconsistent and their faith to a large degree superficial. And although these events happened 3000 years ago, their significance to us is timeless. Because the physical oppressors in the land of Israel are a picture to us of the spiritual oppressors that relentlessly seek to attack God's people. And the judges are the means by which we are to engage in spiritual warfare. Just as the judges sought to defeat their enemies physically, the church is called to go out in the power of the Spirit, equipped by the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to fight our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 11, these things happen to them as an example. We're first introduced to Samson in chapter 13. And for the seventh time in the book, we read these depressing words. And the children of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. We don't hear after this of the people crying out for help, but the Lord does intervene. The angel appears to Manoah, tells him that his wife, who up until this time had been childless, was going to bear a son. And he would be Israel's saviour from the Philistines. And their son was to be called Samson. And it was apparent that the Spirit of God was working mightily in his life. He had a very promising start. He would be a Nazarite from the womb. He was to refrain from alcohol. He wasn't allowed to touch a dead body. He wasn't allowed to cut his hair. Samson's vow to God was to cover the entirety of his life. And every day a Nazarite was living consciously in God's presence. And Samson had it all going for him. His birth announced by an angel, set apart for God's service, chosen to rescue God's people, raised in a godly family, and unusually empowered by the Spirit of God, a man absolutely brimming with potential. He would have been head boy in school, someone to look out for. The last judge in this book, the great hope for Israel, rising to the top. God blessed him richly. And his position brought a great deal of power and prestige. He was popular. He was successful. He was well liked. He had it all going for him. However, in the four chapters we read about Samson's life, we see him warts and all. He was an enigma. Famous for his Herculean strength, killing a lion with his bare hands, killing a thousand Philistines on his own, killed 30 men to pay off a gambling debt. 
his feats as legendary as his flaws his weaknesses as palpable as his strength this is his promising start but secondly we see his pervasive sin as we watch Samson in these four chapters it's very obvious from the outset that he was an impulsive sensual narcissistic man a man dominated by his senses driven by his instincts driven by his lusts driven by his appetites and his big weakness was women and not just any women philistine women those who were outside the covenant community samson was emotionally immature incessantly selfish sexually addicted and in chapter 14 we see him demanding almost begging his parents to arrange a wedding with a, a philistine girl from timna he did marry the girl but because he wouldn't reveal the answer to a riddle he left her and her father gave her to samson's best man but samson out for revenge burned the philistine grain to the, to the ground and the philistines come looking for samson and the israelites were every bit as fearful and every bit as apprehensive as samson as the philistines were so they handed him over to their enemies but just like a hero samson escaped and killed a thousand philistines with the jawbone of a donkey and after this incident we're told that samson judged israel for 20 years it was a time of relative peace and security after that killing spree at the end of chapter 15 we're told samson was very thirsty and he cried out you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant and god miraculously supplied him water this was a time of intimate communion with his god the spirit empowered man in close fellowship in close communion with the lord and this makes the beginning of chapter 16 all the more galling all the more alarming all the more disappointing we're told samson went to gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her you see sometimes after a victory god's people are very susceptible and very vulnerable and son samson astonishingly after this great victory after this time of close communion with god is driven and consumed by lust and he's going again to enemy territory to break the seventh commandment and samson was every bit as stupid as he was sinful he's public enemy number one in gaza it would be like osama bin laden whenever he was alive walking up and down past the white house security gate see samson has gone from the heights to the depths from victory to abject failure and compromise and we all need to be on our guard because invariably success will be harder on us than adversity tiger woods after he was caught in a web of sinful behavior which ended his marriage spoke very candidly afterwards acknowledging that his fame had melt him made him feel entitled that's how Samson felt and perhaps after a time of spiritual victory we may let our guard down and if we do we will be sitting ducks for the enemy and our sin is worse after our times of close communion with the Lord when we have been regularly exposed to the light yet we too easily and too often run to the darkness predictably the Philistines hear about samson's visit to gaza and they were set to ambush him but samson in another superhuman act takes the gates off the city carries them on his back all the way back to hebron which is a journey of 38 miles uphill talk about iron man this is iron man on steroids and that sordid episode in gaza illustrates vividly the glaring inconsistencies in samson's life his superhuman strength and his super sinful weakness listen to what john MacArthur says if samson were superman his own sinful desires were his kryptonite he could kill a lion but not his lust he could break new ropes but not old habits 
He could defeat armies of Philistine soldiers, but not his own flesh. He could carry away the gates of a city, but allowed himself to be carried away when lost in passion. And the first verse that was read for us today, verse 4 of chapter 16, is the beginning of the end for Samson. After this, he loved a woman of the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. Samson sinned after a time of spiritual victory, but we can see here that he also sinned very carelessly. All his life, Samson has been unteachable. And the truth is, our sin is worse whenever we've been careless. And your sin, your particular struggle, it may not be the seventh commandment. It may not be lust. It may be jealousy or anger or dishonesty or idolatry. Whatever your sin is, whatever your struggle is, if you keep exposing yourself to temptation, then you will undoubtedly fall and fall again. Young people listening today, some of your friends are not Christians and their behaviour and their language would drag you down. You know what's best for you, not to spend too long in their company. For all of us today, there are places that we shouldn't go. There are programmes we shouldn't watch. There are websites we shouldn't visit because the temptation is too great. So we should avoid being careless like Samson. We need to avoid putting ourselves in harm's way. You should know that when after Samson was eventually captured by the Philistines, they, they gouged his eyes out. Well, the inescapable truth is it would have been better for Samson if this had happened earlier in his life. It would have saved him a great deal of heartache and a great deal of pain. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Our repentance should be radical and comprehensive, not leaving any doors open. Because remember, sin is crouching at the door. And our culture, on our TV screens, is submerged in sensuality. With many people drowning in a sea of sexual excess and perversion which destroys lives emotionally and morally, which swallows up marriages and families and communities and consumes people. And as in Samson's case, causes people to behave dangerously and recklessly and just like in any addiction, the cycle intensifies. Samson was careless. He was in enemy territory. And his lover, Delilah, is offered an exorbitant amount of money to find the secret to Samson's strength. The five lords of the Philistines each offered her 1,100 pieces of silver. In that particular era, that was 550 times the average salary. So that, in today's terms, we're talking about a figure of around £10 million pounds. Delilah is about to hit the jackpot. And the Philistines don't want to kill Samson. They want to control him. And they want to humiliate him. And they are very aware of his internal weakness despite his external strength. And as Delilah pestered Samson to reveal the secret behind his strength, he should have taken to his heels and run to preserve his testimony exactly the same way Joseph did whenever Potiphar's wife propositioned him. But you see, Samson didn't have the backbone. He didn't have the integrity. He didn't have the self-control of Joseph. He left himself in jeopardy, lying in Delilah's arms. As Warren Wearsby said, sin had anaesthetized him. They say that love is blind. It's very apart from this story that lust is blind also. And Samson didn't know the depravity and the sinfulness of his own heart. And three times Delilah asks him to reveal a secret. Three times he lies to her, but he kept coming back, putting himself in danger. And here we see the destructive power of sin. She emotionally blackmails him. If you really love me, and you can see her bottom lip quivering, you would tell me your secret. You can sense how much 
Samson here is addicted to danger, living on the edge, playing with fire, a very dangerous place to be. Samson had sinned after a time of victory. He had sinned carelessly and of course he sinned presumptuously. After he eventually revealed his big secret to Delilah, she called for the barber and he gives Samson the short back and sides. And Delilah is exposed for the opportunist that she was and she taunted Samson as he awoke from his sleep. And Samson said, I will go arise and go out at other times and shake myself free. And then some of the saddest words in the entire Bible. He did not know that the Lord had left him. This spirit and part man now, knew, now realizes the spirit has left him. And Samson has been playing with fire for years. He hadn't got burnt. He had retained his superhuman strength. And it seems to me that Samson had reached the stage of self-deception. Believing that it was his strength, not the Nazarite vow. It was his own and no matter how much he disobeyed God, no matter how he behaved, no matter who he slept with, he would never lose his strength. Samson was so presumptuous. Unable to see how much he needed God's grace every day. He was presuming on God's grace. He was presuming that God would forgive him. And that's a very dangerous place to be. And after our presumptuous sins, the Lord may remove some of our privileges. He may discipline us. He may allow us to go through fatherly displeasure. So that we will be humble. And that we will forsake our sin once and for all we need to grasp the pervasive nature of sin like Delilah sin is relentless it is aggressive it is persistent it will hammer away at our resistance until we give in to its advances when we do like Samson we always lose the best advice for us all is to put as much distance between ourselves and the source of our sin and temptation as we possibly can. As I said a few weeks ago, sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And on our own strength, we will fail. And not even the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Samson, the military acumen of David can defeat sin. We have an enemy who wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. So we need a saviour to help us. We need to be yielded and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need divine power. Remember Jesus came to save his people from their sins. So we are not to get comfortable with our sins. We are to fight sin relentlessly. We are to avoid sinning carelessly and to avoid sinning presumptuously. And if we call the things things trivial which God says are significant we will undoubtedly fall and bring great dishonour to the cause of the gospel we all need God's power in our lives and this depends on consecration and discipleship because it is essentially a relational power when we are wholeheartedly unreservedly unconditionally committed to serving him and being loyal to him with all our hearts. And our reading which began with despicable sin in verse 4 of chapter 16 ends with divine grace in verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Samson's strength is returning, reminding us again today that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Lastly, today we see Samson's perfect saviour. Amazing as it may seem to us, Samson with all his flaws, all his weaknesses, in his life we see glimpses that point us to the ultimate judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. Tim Keller says, In Othniel we learn that God can save through all, in Deborah that he can save through many, in Gideon that he can save through a few, and in Samson that he can save through one. God will save by sending the one. Samson's birth, predicted by angels, reminds us 
of a thousand years later Jesus' birth predicted by an angel that he would be miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. Both Samson and Jesus were answers to Israel's bondage and oppression. Both stories moved from their birth to adulthood. Samson was destined to deliver his people. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit as Jesus was fully and perfectly. Samson had a Gentile wife. Jesus died for the whole world, Jew and Gentile. Samson spoke in riddles which many people didn't understand. Jesus spoke in parables which the majority of the people didn't understand either. Samson was betrayed by a loved one, Delilah. Jesus was betrayed by one of his inner circle, Judas. Samson killed all his enemies whenever he brought down the Philistine temple. Jesus defeated our three great enemies, sin and Satan and death, by his death and resurrection. So you see there are many similarities between Samson and Jesus. But the contrasts are much greater. And the similarities really heighten the contrasts all the more. Samson shows the evident inadequacy and poverty of all of Israel's deliverers as he constantly capitulates to sin. He was very much an immoral and perfect man. Jesus was the only perfect man. The real saviour of the world wouldn't, through, wouldn't save through power and honour but ultimately through shame and disgrace on a lonely cross. And although Samson was unusually empowered by the Holy Spirit and simultaneously by his impulses driven by his all-consuming lust, Jesus was continually, constantly driven by God's perfect will tempted as we are yet without sin surrounded by women even by prostitutes but never once yielding to lust he never sinned after a time of close communion with his father he never sinned carelessly he never sinned presumptuously and unlike samson who felt proud and entitled jesus who deserved a throne said he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Samson was possibly the strongest man who ever lived, but internally he was weak. He was a compromiser and he was a failure, as so are all the so-called heroes of the Bible. Only one man, the God-man, lived a perfect life. Only he is qualified to be our saviour, because only a perfect man could pay for our sins you see on the cross the lord jesus endured the wrath of god for us he bore our sins in his body on the tree he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities so that we could go free so that we could be forgiven so that we could be guaranteed heaven if you're watching today and you're not a christian i believe god has been speaking very clearly in these days of pandemic Maybe he's been speaking to you for quite a while. Once again today, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Saviour, welcomes you. He died for sinners and he died for you. And he calls you today to repent of your sin and to put your trust in him as your Saviour. As we see very clearly today in the tragic story of Samson, sin is serious. And as Christians, we need to continually use the means of grace in this relentless battle time spent in the word of god as jesus did time memorizing and meditating on the word of god as jesus did time spent in precious prayer as jesus did pleading for god's help pleading for god's power and to live in such a way that brings great glory to our heavenly father it is possible the chorus of that great hymn says Ask the Saviour to help you, comfort, strengthen and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. We thank God for his precious word to our hearts today. The Grant family are going to sing for us today. Lord, I lift your name on high.
to Ian and Judith, to Peter, Jenny and Michael for singing for us this morning. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your precious word. Thank you for the many lessons we learn from the life of Samson, this very strong man externally, but very weak internally. And our Father, we thank you that he, in some ways he points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only perfect man who ever lived. We thank you that he is the real hero of the Bible. He is the only one we can trust. He is the only saviour of the world. Help us, our Father, as your people, to live lives that are God-honouring and God-glorifying. Help us to fight sin tooth and nail. Help us, our Father, not to put ourselves in danger or in jeopardy, not to play with fire because we will most certainly get burnt. We pray for those who are watching today as Christians who maybe have had a, a poor week, who have let you down. We thank you that we're still in the age of grace. We thank you that you're a God who delights to forgive and you will restore if people genuinely repent of their sin and their compromise. Pray for anyone again today watching who's still not a Christian, still outside the family of God. May this be the day whenever they will realise that their sin is serious and they will realise fully and finally that the Lord Jesus Christ dealt with the sin problem on the cross. May this be a day of salvation blessing. We give you thanks for your help for this service today. Be with us for the remainder of the day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Trust you have a good day. God bless you all.